So let's look at foreign policy, and we're going to focus on American foreign policy, starting with uh, our first president, George Washington, and then we're going to move to and through um, our fifth president, uh, James Monroe. And so that's what this uh, quick video will focus on. So when we talked about George Washington's presidency, we didn't really mu we didn't get to his uh, farewell address very much, and that was purposeful because I knew we'd get to it here. Uh, and so. American foreign policy, uh, or in the early days, was a foreign policy of neutrality. And George Washington sets this out in his farewell address, but this has already been his foreign policy throughout his um, presidency. And during this time, he, uh, during this address, he kind of sets that out. He, he encourages the nation to avoid long-term entangling alliances. In other words, a short-term um, agreement between nations to help one another if if they decide to do that for a particular instance, for a particular event, for a particular war, that's fine. But uh, agreeing to be um, bound to one another for, you know, for long term is a mistake. And that kind of brings France and Britain come to mind here because he realizes, hey, these other countries, they, Britain and France, get in, go to war on a regular basis, and so if we ally ourselves with one side or the other, we're going to be pulled into all of their wars, and we're uh, too young a nation, and it doesn't really benefit us to do that. Uh, and what we're going to start to see is is a key to American foreign policy is simply, you know, although we're very closely connected through trade with Europe, we are separated by the Atlantic Ocean, and so the Atlantic Ocean provides a barrier for us to so much of what goes on in the rest of the world. And so that is kind of one big key to our foreign policy is the Atlantic Ocean. Um, he In this farewell address, um, now he doesn't address, he doesn't say, you know, he doesn't mention what I just said about the, farewell, about the Atlantic Ocean. Um, what you see there in the notes is kind of his, what he focuses on in uh, the farewell address. Now his farewell address addresses other things besides foreign policy. We're just focusing on the foreign policy aspect. Um, he, he, he reminds people, remember, uh, France and Great Britain, if they are trying to encourage us to go to war with one, uh, with the other, or anything like that, or join with them, it's because it's in their best interest. And they are looking out for their best interest, not our best interest. So um, the United States needs to keep in mind their own best interest and not the interest of one over the other. And then we see this last bullet here. And this one uh, is pretty interesting. It says, let me just read it and then we'll talk a little bit. I'll tell you a little bit more. So don't let your sympathy for one country or hatred for another influence you. Do what is best for our country. So Washington is often described as being completely kind of separated from political parties and not really a part of it or anything like that. And he didn't claim a political party, but if you look at his policies, they are primarily Federalist policies. And if you look at this, his what he's encouraging, what he's suggesting, don't let your sympathy for one country or hatred for another influence you. Well, what does that sound like? Who would we be sympathetic with? Well, we're most likely to be sympathetic with France because France helped us in the Revolutionary War, so we're going to feel sympathy towards them. They are going through revolution, um, trying to gain uh, and, and overthrow these long-held um, oppressions by their king and, and, and create a republic, but they're having a great difficulty in doing that. And so we have a lot of sympathy for France. And then he says, or your hatred for another. Well, who would be who would Americans likely hate at this time? This is not that far removed from our revolution, so we're very likely. He's saying, "Hey, don't let your hatred for Great Britain and the the war that we ha that happened. Don't let either your sympathy for France or your hatred for Britain influence you." Now, he doesn't use the he doesn't say the names of these countries, but that's pretty clear. And so he's really setting up the Federalist perspective here. He's saying, "Hey." We can't just go to war on against Britain on the side of France because um, we feel sympathy or hatred. We need to do what is best for our own country. And what is best for us at this time is a policy of neutrality, not getting involved. And that policy that Washington set forward 
and was um, continued by Adams. He continued to try to avoid war. You might remember the XYZ affair and those those types of events. He's trying to avoid war, and uh, then and and likely doesn't uh, isn't reelected in large part because of that. Um, and then Jefferson comes into power, and Jefferson also uh, generally is wanting to avoid war. And during Jefferson's presidency, he is successful. Um, he doesn't go to war, but it's becoming increasingly more difficult. As Britain and France's war becomes hotter and hotter and the fighting between them becomes hotter and hotter, um, base, Britain declares commercial war on us. We cannot, um, they do not let us trade with anybody uh, base, other than them. They're, they're attacking our American shipping. They're impressing our sailors, which we talked about in the in the previous videos. And so Jefferson's response is, okay, we're going to cease all trade. And he does this for a particular reason. He realizes um, he, he wants to end, he wants to end this problem. He's hoping that this economic act, the, the, that it will hurt Britain and France economically. And so they'll stop attacking our shipping. Um, but it's, it's a bigger economic disaster for the United States. And so um, he, he tries basically a really isolationist, isolating ourselves away from the rest of the world. Um, but it's economic disaster for us. Our economy goes down immediately. Our tra uh, regions of the country that really rely on trade are just in, in big trouble. And so um, this only lasts about 15 months. And then he says, OK, we'll take that back. And he says, we'll just end trade with Britain and France. The problem is once you say... Well, ships can leave and go to other countries besides Britain and France. Once they leave our ports, we really have no way of knowing where they're going. So they can go and trade with Britain or France or whoever else, and it's unenforceable. It's impossible to keep track. So he tries in an isolationist, with the embargo, he tries isolationism, basically. But that's not going to work because it destroys our economy. So then he tries something less severe, but that makes it unenforceable, which is why he tried the embargo, the full-fledged embargo at first, is because he knew the other wouldn't work. Well, then once Madison comes to, to power, um, he continues to have these problems. Great Britain becomes more and more, um, is continuing to attack our shipping, and it just becomes too much. And eventually the United States does declare war. Uh, there's there's other reasons here. We, you know, we're we're hoping to gain Canada and some other things out of this. But the United States declares war, and so we go from neutrality, neutrality, um, to almost an isolationism, to declaring war and becoming involved again. Uh, but our the hand, uh, America's hand was kind of forced. At least they felt like it was. Um, it, it wasn't meant necessarily. Uh, there wasn't some huge drastic change. It was just a long period of time where uh, our neutrality is being violated. And then that leaves us uh, to the Monroe Doctrine and James Monroe. And so, the, uh, you know, as we've, we, we talked about in previous videos, the, the War of 1812 ends, everything kind of goes back to the way it was, but now Britain and France aren't going to be attacking our shipping because they're not at war anymore. And so things calm down for a bit. And uh, the Monroe Doctrine is kind of a shift toward isolationism. It's not complete isolationism. We continue to trade, um, but it's, it's really trying to say, hey, the Atlantic Ocean is your boundary. You don't come over here. Europe, you stay over on your side. Uh, we'll stay on our side. Uh, this It's known as the Monroe Doctrine, but it's actually written by John Quincy Adams, his Secretary of State. And the basic me message is this. We do not desire to get involved in European affairs, and Europe should no longer be involved in North and South America's affairs. Don't come over here and nose around in our business. Uh, this shows America's growth as a nation. It's 1823. Um, the war, uh, the American Revolution was over in 1783, so it's been, um, you know, decades since that war. The War of 1812 has been over far, um, for a, for many years now, and so the United States is starting to, to move toward being a world power. They're not really there yet, but they're moving that direction. Um, the other point, the other reason why the Monroe Doctrine, why we're able to kind of make this proclamation and say, hey, don't get involved over here, is because Britain is supporting it. Now, they don't come out and say that exactly, 
but um, they don't want Spain or Portugal or these other countries trying to to come back and get more involved in North and South America. Great Britain has kind of come to the realization they're not going to be terribly involved here, and so they don't want to they these other European countries getting trying to gain control. Again, so they really support the the Monroe Doctrine. The, in other words, the British Navy kind of gives the teeth to the word, the American words, because although we're becoming more powerful, we're not really a world power yet, and so we don't have the teeth to back up our our, our bark, so to speak. Um, so why now? Why does the Monroe Doctrine? Why is it issued now? Well, what's been going on uh, in earlier in the 1820s and the end of the 18 uh, 18 uh, 19, 18, 18, and so is many of these uh, Latin American countries are gaining independence or fighting for independence from their European colonizers. And so by this time, they're they've really a lot of them have gained their independence, and the U.S. wants to let Europe know, hey, you don't come back over here and try to regain these lost colonies. You've lost the colonies; they're their own independent nation, and you don't need to come back and try to get back involved in them. We will see that as an act of war, and so we will kind of protect our hemisphere. You stay in your hemisphere, we will stay in ours. And that's the Monroe Doctrine. So we see um, a, a movement of neutrality, uh, dealing with uh, uh, the Embargo Act as, as a move towards isolationism, and then getting reinvolved, and then the Monroe Doctrine kind of saying, hey, you stay on your side, we'll stay on our side, and it's that shift toward isolationism. And the uh, Atlantic Ocean is kind of the big barrier that makes so much of this possible. So that is uh, foreign policy in the early republic.